I want to welcome you really heartily to this event. From today, exactly in three weeks, the 8th of December, it will be 30 years since uh, there was a group of people who talked and decided the dissolution of Soviet Union. Certainly one of the most important and most decisive geostrategic decisions of the 20th century, or you could say of modern history. And it is a really great pleasure for me that uh, we could organize, especially with the help of uh, Ambassador uh, Martin Seidig, this event and bring the signatories of this dissolution accord here to Vienna. It certainly is a more or less unique opportunity. And I want to welcome, of course, not only the participants, uh, but especially also our speakers. And first of all, I want to say it's uh, a great pleasure for us that we can welcome uh, the prominent speakers from the three countries that decided to dissolute three out of the four countries who had decided in 1922 to shape Soviet Union. And then it was Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine, the representatives of those countries uh, in 1991, uh, who decided to dissolute this uh, organization or this country. And it's my really great pleasure to welcome Witold Foking, the Prime Minister, a former Prime Minister of Ukraine. He's already sitting on the table. He was together with President Kravchuk. Uh, also, President Kravchuk was already ready to come, but uh, he was hospitalized and uh, at the end could not come at this opportunity. For the Russian side, it was, on the one hand, uh, Yeltsin, President Yeltsin, and on his side, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Gennady Perpulis. And we really want to welcome him uh, and say how glad we are that you came. We will have the opportunity uh, to listen to Stanislav Shushkevich, no. the former head of Belarus, via video. He could not come. But uh, in his place, I don't hear. there will be Piotr Kravchenko, the former foreign minister and the one man who more or less did the writing work for this dissolution. This will be a discussion of the signatories. And we are looking forward uh, not only to listen uh, what were the backgrounds, what were the motives, what, how was the situation when this was organized, but of course we also want to listen uh, to some other people in order to get a little bit out the perspectives from the Western side. And in this respect, it's a Real pleasure for me to welcome our former Chancellor Wolfgang Schüssel, uh, who used to be minister at this time when the dissolution process came on. Uh, on his side is Horst Telczyk, the former security advisor for Helmut Kohl and also the first uh, head of the Munich Security Conference, uh, a man who certainly was in the center of all these uh, speeches. Then we also have uh, Thomas Graham. He is uh, a senior advisor for, for the dialogue of human, for the human, humanitarian dialogue center. Uh, and he is an outstanding academic uh, teaching at American universities and so on. And last but not least, uh, we also will have 
Christian Wehrschütz, uh, who is more or less every day either in uh -huh. Ukraine at the Russian-Ukrainian border or uh, in southeastern Europe uh, in the region of ex-Yugoslavia. Certainly a man who knows the situation much, much better <coughs> than most of the others. I want to welcome also, uh, of course, our guests, uh, participants. I only see a few, I can see a few uh, ambassadors, former mi ministers, at least <coughs> some I do have on my list. But I think uh, we should go try to go immediately into the center of these presentations. And maybe before we start and ask uh, the signatories about their experiences, I just want to make a very short recall uh, what happened. It was on the 8th of December 1991 when uh, signatories of the three states decided to dissolute. And they did it due to the possibility the Soviet, uh, Soviet Constitution had or presented as a possibility to dissolute the state to seed more or less the organization. And certainly, this was something that was not easy for them. It certainly brought a geostrategic situation that changed almost everything. It changed the geostrategic position of Moscow. And on the other hand, it created new countries, new nations, new nation states. And this was only the be not really the beginning, because the Baltic countries okay. had already left Soviet Union a few months before in summer 1991. And a few weeks later, also the rest of the states, the South Caucasian countries and the Central uh, Asian countries followed. With the Alma-Ata Protocol, they decided at least 11 out of 12 uh, also to found new national states. And this certainly has not only brought a completely different geostrategic situation also for Western Europe, uh, because from this moment, the danger <coughs> of a military invasion from the eastern flank for Central or Western European countries did not exist anymore. Certainly one of the most decisive moments uh, in the security or in the history of uh, European security. On the other hand, of course, it's also the destruction of uh, an entity uh, in economic, cultural, and social ways that does have and will have consequences. And when we talk about this today, this shall not only be uh, memorizing what has happened 30 years ago, but we have to be aware that we still are living in a period where we are probably at least partly affected by what has happened then. When we now uh, I informed that just two days ago, the foreign ministers of Germany and France uh, asked the Russian government uh, for reluctance, for retainment. They asked for more uh, transparency due to the fact that there is a concentration of troops alongside the Ukrainian border. Uh, when we are inform, informed by the media that there are uh, Russian bombers, aircraft bombers, uh, very close between the Belarusian and the Polish border, this certainly uh, reminds us that it is of extreme importance, not only uh, to talk about what is going on now, but to try to understand what has happened, what are the consequences, and what we can do in order to get out of it. Insofar, I'm very sure that this can become a highly interesting uh, evening. And I just want to go over. The first panel uh, will be moderated by Ambassador Seidig, 
and then the second panel will be moderated uh, by Direct Ambassador Briggs. And dear Emil, I ask you formally uh, to say a few words of welcome to us. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I can start where Werner Fasselabend finished. Uh, it is a discussion about the momentous moment in, in world history, uh, and we are proud that we can be hosts here at the Diplomatic Academy, the Vienna School of International Studies. Actually, we seem to be a good place to discuss disruptions. We had here Mitscher uh, and Klaus sitting 25 years after the disruption uh, of Czechoslovakia. Uh, and we very often discuss here uh, the disruption of the Habsburg Empire after the First World War. Uh, but with the Soviet Union, it's something different because it's so close, actually, to our present day. When we think about 18 countries, 18 countries are the consequence uh, of this signature 30 years ago. Uh, in the Austrian case, after the First World War, it's about 10 countries which came out of the Habsburg monarchy. But this here is 18 countries. Uh, and one of the big achievements, and I guess you will discuss it tonight, was that it was agreed that there should be territorial integrity of the countries coming out of the Soviet Union, uh, and that it should be done everything on consensus. Uh, and as we know, these 30 years have shown that uh, you can promise something in a document, but then the question is of the implementation and what, what it really means. Uh, and just to remind us all, if for those who do not recall this, uh, already in 2005, President Vladimir Putin called the dissolution of the Soviet Union the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. Actually, he followed up in 2018 when he said, actually, if he could do something, what we would do, his answer was, want to rebuild the Soviet Union. 2018, at a speech in Kaliningrad, he said, if he could do it, he would rebuild the Soviet Union. Uh, I guess these are the issues we are talking about. It's not about small scale internal affairs. It's about really geopolitical issues that we are discussing here. And 30 years is not so far away, actually, when we do this. Uh, and uh, my, my real feeling is that when we discuss all the problems and conflicts that came out of the dissolution, one thing we should always keep in mind, to my mind, because maybe not the signature, but the happenings of the years 89 to 91 signaled the end of the second world, of the communist world. Uh, and that's something actually we should be proud of. Maybe we discuss it afterwards also when we speak about the Western perceptions. It was the end of the communist world uh, with all the problems that come out of a less stable political situation. But at least here at, at this school, we teach our students that we should be proud that it was we were able to achieve this in an almost peaceful way. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to host you all here, and I'm much looking forward to our discussions. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, next welcome will come from David Haaland. Haaland. David Haaland is the executive director of the Center for humanitarian dialogue. And uh, they certainly did a great job in assisting not only from the organization, but also uh, by spending some money. Because you can imagine, this was more than one organization could afford in this moment. So far, we are really thankful. Please, uh, your words of welcome. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm actually probably the one in this room who knows least about these events. But I have to say that um, uh, Martin Seidick introduced me to, to President Kravchuk a few months ago. And I, I couldn't resist. Uh, I'm so sorry he's not able to be here. I know he wanted to be here. Um, but I, I must say that um, I, I couldn't resist asking him a little bit about that day. And, and I must say I was astonished as a relative uh, newcomer to the, the events. You know, he, he described you know, the, the general context in which you know, there were 
maneuverings against the, the role of Gorbachev, the, the, the three came together who we, we were about to hear, hear from. And, and at least as, as he recalled it, there was a sort of moment of hesitation at the beginning. Um, they looked at each other, Yeltsin came in late, um, they weren't sure, somebody looked at Yeltsin, Yeltsin said, well, let's have a drink. <laughs> uh, and they, they got down to it, and then the, the drafting, which we'll hear, was, was done. And, and then there was a, a pause, and Kravchuk said, you know, and somebody said, you know, we better tell Gorbachev, yeah. And uh, uh, they realized they couldn't do that very easily. And, and then there was a, a follow-on discussion in which they decided they would, would, would uh, explain things to then-President George H.W. Bush. And then Martin will recall that President Kravchuk said they had this sort of farcical moment where, where uh, they did manage to get through to the US president, but he wasn't sure whether it was a prank call or, or not. And, and so, you know, one, one is struck again by, you know, you know Hegel's um, description of, you know, the, the great man and wh whether or not the events call forward the people or, or the people generate the great events. And, you know, I've almost never come across a sequence of events that, uh, you know, appear so contingent and yet have such sort of colossal impact on, on world history. So it's a, a great uh, pleasure for, for me to be here with those who are participants in, in the event and to have you know, supported in a, in a small way. And you know, on with the show, we're very keen to hear the participants from those incredible events. So thank you very much all for coming. And for, thank you, Martin Seidel. A very nice good evening uh, to everybody. Thank you very much. It is in deep and unbelievable pressure, honor uh, to uh, host everybody here. I hope that we will soon also have uh, uh, Stanislav Stanislavich Shushkevich. We already see him here. Ja vas privjetstvuju, srdečno privjetstvuju se čas u nas na ekranje. Vy chazjain byl, vy přiglašali. You have been uh, the host. You invited everybody to the uh, Belarusko Pusho in Belarus. And this was a big event in history. Uh, it's a great pity that you, Mr. Shushkevich, are not able to be present here today with us. I know you wanted to, but unfortunately, your doctors recommended uh, better not to go on such a trip right now. But we are very happy to be able to talk to you via new, the new technologies. I am convinced that you all came here in order to hear all those people who were part of this important process. Those are historical, historic personalities that actually made history. They made history. To see those who have made history with us. Uh, Bula wird Partisant auf Schäst. Ist nicht Lichna, so just. So there are two people present here now, Mr. Mr. Falken, the former Prime Minister of Ukraine, and Gennady Burbulis, the former deputy prime minister of Russia, and he was very a close, a close aide uh, to Mr. Yeltsin back then. So Mr. Sh Shushkevich was head of the parliament of the of Belarus back then, and he was also head of the Belarusian state starting from 91, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 
I have a small uh, 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 curriculum writer here. I would also like to welcome now uh, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Belarus of this time, Pyotr Kravchenko. He was back then the first and the last Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, the USSR. After that, he uh, became a Minister of Foreign Affairs of the independent Belarusian state. He is not a signatory of the accords, but he is a participant. And he played an important role in drafting this important document. I would... Uh, the uh, participants of our discussion. Uh, I think it is important to understand the background of each uh, person, uh, the background uh, of those who made history. Uh, Stanislav uh, Stanislavich Shushkevich was born in December 1934 in Minsk. He is a doctor of uh, physics and mathematics. And uh, he uh, was the head, as I already mentioned, of the uh, Belarusian uh, parliament and then thus head of state of Belarus uh, from 1991 to January 1994. And uh, he was the chairman of the uh, Supreme Soviet and then also head of state. Uh, he was the key architect of the uh, Commonwealth of I Independent States of uh, CIS uh, and he signed together uh, for Belarus uh, the uh, agreements uh, with, together with uh, Vyacheslav Kebich, the then Prime Minister of Belarus, who uh, left us uh, last year in December. Uh, so uh, Kebich uh, was with uh, uh, Mr. Suskevich, uh, the signatory. Uh, Stanislav Stanislavich uh, Shushevich is also uh, the head of the uh, uh, Socialist Democratic, Social Democratic Assembly Party of Belarus uh, today. So he is also politically active uh, even now. Uh, I would like to uh, turn to uh, Witold Pavlovich Fokin, the former Prime Minister of uh, Ukraine. Witold Pavlovich was born in October 1932. So we can really be happy to have him here and uh, to have his readiness uh, to come and, and join us here and to be together with him. <coughs> he has... Uh, <laughs> he comes from uh, the uh, area of Saparoje. And uh, he, has, uh, uh, he has graduated uh, from uh, the uh, National Mining University of Ukraine in uh, Dnipropetrovsk. He started as a miner, and uh, for uh, a very big part of his life, he was then in the management uh, of different coal mines, uh, especially in the Donbass. Uh, so he knows the Donbass uh, really from uh, his personal experience. The Donbass uh, that is so problematic as we know uh, today and I uh, know that personally uh, very well. Uh, then uh, Vitor Pavlovich made what I would call and I allow myself to say that a Soviet career. Uh, he uh, joined the, uh, in, front, in 1971 he joined uh, the uh, State Planning uh, Commission Gosplan of Ukraine and uh, was uh, in 1990 the head of the State Planning Commission. Then he became uh, Prime Minister of Ukraine uh, until uh, 1992. He is still very much active in uh, Ukrainian political life and uh, he uh, was also uh, a member of the uh, Ukrainian delegation 
to the trilateral contact group uh, on, uh, the, on the conflict in eastern Ukraine uh, it, uh, last year. So uh, really, uh, we are extremely happy uh, to have, uh, as I already said before, to have uh, Vitor Pavlovic here. Gennady Burbulis. Uh, Gennady Burbulis, as you uh, realize, has a Lithuanian name. Uh, his, uh, from his father's side, he is uh, of uh, Lithuanian ancestry. Um, his grandfather was in, uh, in, uh, th during the First World War, still in the Russian uh, no, Tsarist Empire, exiled to the Urals. Uh, he was born on the 4th of August, 1945. Imagine, just right after the war. I know somebody who sits here who was born uh, even a little bit early, just right at the end of the war. It's uh, Wolfgang Schüssel, who was born on the 7th of June, 1945. Uh, but it is, it is something uh, really uh, special if you are, you know, uh, really come, come to life right at the end uh, after the end of, the, uh, of the sec this uh, horrible Second uh, World War. Um, he uh, grew up in the, in the Urals, uh, studied philosophy, and finished uh, philosophy, the studies of philosophy at the Ural University. Uh, he uh, was a cloat, as we know, uh, he was one of the main architects of uh, Russian political and economic uh, reforms. He was a close associate of Boris Yeltsin, and uh, as I already mentioned, held several very high positions during the first uh, Russian government, including uh, state secretary. Uh, he was, in still Soviet times, he was uh, the head of the uh, interregional deputies group, which was the first uh, organized opposition in the Soviet Union, and he was uh, one of the prime catalysts of democratic reform in 1989. Uh, he served as then uh, as the deputy prime minister until 1992 and uh, was then uh, two terms in the Duma, uh, then deputy governor of Novgorod Oblast and uh, represented Nova, uh, the Novgorod Oblast in the Federal Assembly until uh, 2007. Uh, uh, he uh, is uh, at the moment uh, the uh, head of, uh, uh, the, of an institute on uh, uh, cultural uh, dignity, uh, culture on, on, on the culture of dignity, not cultural dignity, on the culture of dignity, Kultura das Deutsche, and uh, is uh, uh, a very influential intellectual, even in our days, in Russia. Uh, he signed the uh, Belarusia agreement on the part of Russia, uh, together with uh, Boris Yeltsin, who left us, as we know, in April uh, 2007. Uh, last but not least, I turn uh, to, uh, the, uh, to a participant of this process, not to a secretary, uh, Pyotr Kravchenko, as I already said, then uh, foreign minister of uh, uh, Belarus, uh, uh, Piotr Kravchenko is a historian, a political scientist, uh, and uh, he graduated uh, from the uh, Belarusian State University um, and uh, was also then serving as an ambassador of uh, Belarus in Japan uh, in, uh, from 1999 to 2002. And he is still uh, very much an active historian. Um, I hope I... Uh, presented uh, all your CVs correctly. Uh, and uh, now let's finally turn, uh, as you say, <coughs> let, 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 let us finally turn uh, to uh, the uh, wonderful participants. Kvam, my text is that, uh, uh, Thank you very much that you came here and that you are ready to talk to us. I would like to ask three questions and I would like to ask you to be very brief in your answers so that also the audience will have an opportunity to ask questions. So the first question is uh, for Mr. 
Shushkevich, and I would like to ask you to answer all of you to this question. What were your plans when you went to the Belaveshka Busche in December of 91? What were your plans and your expectations? I'm very happy to answer to your question. I think it would be necessary to imagine the circumstances of this time. All uh, republics had declared their independence and all the property all already belonged to those new independent republics and not uh, to the USSR at this time. So Belarus also had a new property. It was uh, this uh, estate in the Bela, in the Belaverska uh, Pusha. It was very nicely located. Uh, it was possible to go to go hunting from there. And uh, we, when we were in, in Moscow, in Nogogaryov, uh, we decided to invite uh, Mr. Yeltsin to this estate, to the Bela Vierskaya Pucha. And I was asked to meet Mr. Yeltsin. I was in a very, very good relations with him. and. Uh, it was very, it was very necessary, and and the idea was uh, to meet just as a tete, tete a tete, and um, in December, in December, uh, Gorbachev uh, he introduced a new draft of the Union Treaty, which we all came uh, together in order to discuss it. But uh, Yeltsin was not did not agree with everything, and then so um, uh, Gar Gorbachev. Uh, actually left the meeting. We also went out of the building together with Yeltsin. And there we were together, just the two of us, without any witnesses. And uh, this is where I invited him to the Belaverskaya Pusha, to uh, Bela Belarus, for a meeting in order to really talk about the reforms and also about uh, economic questions. Uh, so he came with a large delegation to Belarus with experts, min ministers, and many delegates. And, and there might be be the question uh, why it took so long f from the second, from the 22nd October to the 8th of December for this meeting uh, to take place because we had to prepare. Uh, we also wanted uh, to invite uh, Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine uh, officials in order to discuss uh, the economic situation of the time back then. Thank you very much for this very clear answer. Uh, just I did one. And there is still one question today between Belarusia and Russia, and this is the delivery of oil. And I think this question is not yet decided uh, 30 years afterward, after this event. So I now will go to Vitold Pavlovich, and I would like to ask him, and I would like uh, to ask him to answer this known question already. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador, dear ladies and gentlemen, 
I want to uh, just start with a few remarks. Well, I have some remarks also to uh, the ambassador because he told you when I was uh, born, and you know now that I'm older than the others. So, and the second remark, like Piotr Kuzmich, I was one of the first, and I was one of the last ones. I became the head uh, of uh, the uh, of the ministers and the Council of Ministers, and then I became the first Premier Minister of the Ukraine. And uh, please uh, consider that my words, my uh, position, maybe not, uh, of course, correspond to a general opinion, a general accepted opinion, uh, because I am convinced that everybody of us, of us who signed uh, the, co the, the agreement, had his own ideas, his own expectations. Stanislav Stanislavich told you that he came uh, with thinking about oil. He was thinking about the delivery of oil. And I tell you with which thoughts I came at that time, to be quite frank, that what happened in these snowy fields of Bielowieszy and Pusha was not, of course, a treachery. It was not a conspiracy. We came to this place uh, and we thought uh, uh, about our our country. Everybody uh, thought about his state, about his country, and and we wanted the well-being of our countries. And uh, the ambassador has told you already, and Stanislav Stanislav Stanislavich has mentioned that too. Uh, well, we. We did not have the intention to uh, sign a new agreement. A lot of republics, I would like to say all the republics, did not want to sign this agreement. Mr. Gorbachev was nervous, nervous and he did uh, a lot in order to force uh, the republics to sign this agreement, but uh, the question was not yet decided. And when we uh, uh, just proposed, I think, in Nova Gorova, I cannot say exactly where we did this, then uh, we came uh, to this place not with our cars as it was normal, but we came with normal buses. And we were, dry, we were in these buses, and there was the president of Kazakhstan, Nusrtan Nazarbayev, and, and everybody thought about his own situation, but we all were thinking about one thing. And of course, this influenced, uh, uh, of course, what we did. Well, we, and Nusultan told me when we saw the village, and he thought, what do you think, we told? So uh, they, they are so, they open the door now so uh, quickly, but will they also let us leave? And we were a little bit worried that we could not leave that place so easily. Of course, this uh, was not a real danger. Our fears were not justified, and we drove back with the same good company. And I think, and I thought, Shouldn't it be possible for the leaders of the biggest Soviet republics 
and also uh, the Soviet Union, which is a member of the uh, UN, uh, to uh, meet uh, with Gorbachev. We could not talk with Mr. Gorbachev. And, and Stanislav Stanislavich, uh, well, 30 years is a very long period, but some said, really, let's meet him. And he invited all to meet in Pusha. And I do not know about what uh, Gennady Eduardovich thought. I do not know about what uh, Kevich thought and Stanislav Stanislavich. But I thought about one thing. The Ukraine had now the chance to uh, get the real sovereignty, uh, the real independence, and to have its own democratic socialist state. And this was uh, just giving me new spirits. This was calming me down. And this was also uh, uh, supporting me to come to Pusha. And I told you already, maybe my opinion is not the opinion of the others, but I did not think that Yeltsin, I thought Yeltsin would just propose us to have some drinks. And then uh, there are so many legends now about this Viscoli place. And one of the legends is that uh, we were drunk and these people in a drunk situation then decided the fate of a big country. But this is, was not true. We were really working very hard. We were completely sober. Uh, but it was 30 years ago, and we were at this time young and uh, healthy men. And after this very heavy times and during the dinner, we were drinking something. Yes, we were drinking whiskey and vodka. I think this is a normal situation. But in the morning, we were all sober again, and we worked again very hard. And we wanted to formulate. And the one who did uh, the main wording was Gennady Eduardovich Burbulis. And, and we, were not, we did not always agree with him. There were, more, let's say, two sides. Some, uh, and we were going into two uh, directions. But I really respect his practical attitude and also his cleverness because uh, we worked very hard, but we were also quite productive. And maybe also a few words, a few general words. Of course, uh, for 30 years ago in Viscolas, uh, very, very important historical events took place. And the political map of the world was radically changed. And what happened afterwards, uh, well, I will talk about that later tomorrow when we meet again. Thanks. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. I think Werner Fassleben uh, talked about that already with the Ukraine uh, from Ukraine, also Mr. Kravchuk wanted to come, but unfortunately he talked about that already in May, and he told us that he really would like to participate, as David said already, but unfortunately he cannot do that anymore. He's in the hospital, and we hope very much that he will be healthy soon. And and when, and I will talk about that now. So now I will give the word to Gennady, and uh, he will, I would like to say, I, I have seen you today at the airport, 
I saw you, of course, but not the first time at the airport. I saw you still when you were in the Supreme Sovi Soviet uh, 98, and I was uh, observing you from the tribune. I was a diplomat at that time, and I was one of the very rare diplomats who we really were sitting there. And it was very interesting at that time. And then I saw at that time already that you are a very, uh, very active person. Gennady, please. In this year, we have 90 years uh, of Mr. Yeltsin. He would have been 90 years. And he was uh, the first elected president of Russia. And of course, uh, I really will acknowledge and I would like if we really can, uh, his, can evaluate his role correctly. His role uh, at the 8th of December and what he did on the 8th of December. There is, there is a certain universal rule. And I'm very thankful, and I would like to thank you all, dear colleagues, coming from this academy, coming from Vienna, coming from Austria. I'm very, I would like to thank you for this initiative. Just to find out and to try to understand what happened 30 years ago and uh, not uh, always thinking about what happened at this time and just uh, not let these memories distort, but just think about the culture of, rem of memories. Because uh, memory, of course, is uh, subject to metamorphosis, and it is mobile. And memories may change every year, every day. Uh, but a real memory is subject to metastasis, and, and there are some conscious and unconscious uh, things happening and which you do not want to tell, which are sometimes too difficult, and sometimes you open new memories. I am very much convinced that all of us here, we are all people in history. We are all part of our generation, of our homeland, of our country. And in all of us, there is history. And your initiative is uh, so important for all of us. I would say this is something very important in a so peaceful country like this, so that you have a wish to know more about this most important event of history in the 20th century. There have been many events. Before this, uh, there was this Novogaryov process. Before the treaty, and, but there were two events that were very important for this as well. One is August. Uh, the, the 19th and the 20th August of 91. The coup d'etat, the August coup d'etat, which I call the political Chernobyl of the uh, Soviet totalitarian system. 
the Chernobyl nuclear tragedy, tragedy and the Soviet Empire was kind of shaken by this coup d'etat. And uh, we need to understand uh, that on the 24th of December, when those uh, putschists were arrested and put into prison, this is when the Soviet Union ceased to exist. So it was the 24th of August. And then there was another very important day. This is the 1st of December. The referendum held in Ukraine. Ukraine achieved its legitimacy for independ independence. It has striven for independence and sovereignty, sovereignty for many years. Now they elected a president and there was a referendum held. And in history, in modern history, this is something very, very important. And it talks of uh, a lot of like-minded people working at this. And uh, Stanislav Stanislavovich Shushkevich had the idea to invite us to Belarus and to solve the problems of uh, the energy problems of the countries. And to us, it was obvious that uh, Ukraine already was at a different stage. And the Soviet Union had already started disintegrating and actually did not exist anymore. And also Gorbachev was on a different stage. So we received an, a very important historic incentive from Ukraine due to this development. We had to understand what we need to do together after everything that had happened. And I'm not going to hide that Yeltsin and our group, we went together and uh, we actually promised to Gorbachev that we would try to talk with you and with Kravchuk about uh, coming back to this idea of a renewed union. And when we saw the categoric stance of Ukraine, they told us, we have already changed. We are different now. We are through this pro process. And Mr. Kravchuk, he said, actually, there is no need to discuss this. I don't even know where the Kremlin is, and I don't know a Mr. Gor Gorbachev. I don't know him. So we don't need either of them. We are independent and sovereign. But uh, we had pr promised to Mr. Gorbachev to talk to the Ukraine then president, and it turned out that uh, no association or confederation or soft association would be possible. And here, the, maybe the most interesting and the most uh, secretive idea came up. And we have discussed it very often already the Commonwealth 
after the Second World War uh, and the empire showed the world community how a transition can be possible. And uh, this world, common world, just the word, not the concept of it, just the word of it was something that appealed to us. And Kravchuk and Fokin said, just wait, wait, so commonwealth. So this doesn't mean any special obligations. It's just about trust, about friendship, about finding new forms of dialogue, maybe even consensus. No, but without this uh, heaviness of a union and this what came out of our tense work back then. I would like to say what is most important, what is most important. Our life, our lives, our countries are full of suffering. They are full of tests and they are also full of ideas, but we need to have the ability not only of political orientation, but ethics and aesthetics also need to play a role because in such an extreme situation of choice, it's not about pragmatism and interests. But ethics, the good things, the ethics of freedom become important. And of course, there is also some aesthetic beauty to those, to those events. Uh, man lives in history, and history lives in man. But what we need an organic synthesis. We need aesthetics, we need ethics. And I think today we could actually talk about this link between those. Thank you very much for those not only interesting, but also very deep and philosophical thoughts. Thank you very much. I would like to say, yes, I understand you talked about the coup. And uh, I didn't know that one could name it the political Chernobyl. I was, uh, I happened to be in Moscow at this time, and I cannot understand up until now how the KGB, uh, the Ministry of Defense, uh, the Ministry of the Interior, and the Prime Minister can unite and organize a coup d'etat against uh, the president and do this within five days. So I think this, uh, that this political Chernobyl is something that many people cannot understand even today, not only here, but also in the Soviet space. But this is my, this is my personal uh, opinion. Mr. Kravchenko, uh, you are not one of the signatories. You just went there because you were told to do so. So what did you think back then, what was going on? What were your thoughts? Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear Mr. Faslabend, dear Mr. Briggs, dear Mr. Harlem, dear Mr. Seidig, 
I would like to express my sincere gratitude for the organization of this unique meeting. I agree with Mr. Bourboulis that the collapse of the USSR is the main event of the 20th century. So it's this krach, it's this collapse as something that was historically inevitable. So I'm empires, uh, they uh, emerge and they also dissolve, they distinguish. So the USSR was an empire. And the, the First uh, World War uh, played an important role in the emergence. Uh, that, that is when the, the British Empire vanished, uh, and uh, also the Solidarność movement in Poland played a role, but still a col collapse is uh, the vanishing of something very, very important. It was the, the collapse of communism, of the philosophy, of the politics of this time. And I very well understand our brothers and sisters from other countries. And I think uh, it is very important uh, to mention something that was very aesthetic. When we remember something that's, that has gone, that has vanished, then we have um, certain feelings. But very important is that this transition happened without bloodshed. And this is due uh, to Mr. Yeltsin, Shushkevich, Gaidar, and Mr. Saidik. And I would like uh, to remember these uh, people now by getting up from our seats and remembering them. Now we can sit down again. I agree with Mr. Bourboulis that we need to distinguish uh, between uh, the de facto and the de jure collapse of the USSR. Since December 91, the USSR uh, de facto has not uh, existed any longer, but the URI, the process, had not been determined. So the, uh, the end started not only during the, uh, the uh, coup, but uh, before that, when a, a law on banks were passed in the Duma, and uh, this was something, and this event uh, is something uh, that does not get enough attention, unfortunately. We don't have time to discuss this all today. But this was uh, when the USSR started dissolving. This uh, was uh, in June, then the, refer the coup d'etat, and then the referendum in Ukraine, and the signatories were responsible for the de jure, uh, de jure signing of this coll collapse, which had happened before. It was like a mirror showing that a political organism had died. And of course, it is a great merit merit that there was this uh, de jure signing, and we were able to avoid bloodshed, a civil war, and also a conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we remember what Rutskoy said back then when he said, what we have, nuclear weapons, 
This was in fall of 91. And you can imagine that uh, in the context of what was happening between, what is happening between Russia and Ukraine right now, what could have happened back then. And uh, the Swedish secret services also said that a civil war is possible. I'm not going to talk about the Caucasus and the other conflicts. You know about all of them. But I would like to say that this Belaveja Accords is a very bold historic improvisation uh, as far as the legal aspect of the collapse is concerned. Nobody thought that this will be the end. Mr. Falkin talked about the economy. Shushkevich also talked about this. So everybody has his has their own approaches but nobody thought that this empire could, could collapse so quickly and we thought that we would actually discuss political issues when we went to the to the busher and so we actually landed at a military airport near to the near have to do some agreement and I said Andre do we have a draft and he said no we don't have anything but before that we have to agree how we can do this dissolution of uh, this of the Soviet Union and then you and me and Gaidar then we can do the wording but before that we uh, we need some agreement and we uh, we need some wording about the Soviet Union and so I, I think tomorrow we will talk about more details but the main thing is this three countries and the leaders of these three countries came uh, to uh, Bielowiesza Pushin to, uh, spo uh, to talk about the most important issue. How can we stop the, uh, the crisis, the economical crisis? How can we just stop the perspectivelessness of our uh, people? How can we stop the hunger of our army? How can we do that? And I uh, and the, the team who was uh, in Bielowieszy, these were just more or less leaders of a sheep, of a ship, and they knew that uh, they were, an, and they knew that they have to come to the country in a few months. And we have to know, we uh, we had to think about how we could save this drowning Soviet Union and how we could just guarantee a normal and civilized dissolution of the Soviet Union, one of the biggest empires of the 20th century. Thank you very much. It was very interesting what you were saying. It was really. Uh, uh, something new for myself. Well, I think I still have two questions, and but I will just bring uh, bring them together to one question so that our audience has the possibility to ask questions. Well, the first of these two questions is when you signed the agreement. Uh, then did you uh, know the value or the uh, importance of this step? And the second very natural question is when we look at today's relation of the countries of the post-Soviet Union, did you expect this, de de this development, 91? And I think the second question is a very natural question. And uh, of a person who is not a Soviet citizen, but uh, I would like to start with Stanislav Stanislavovich. Thank you that you talked about these issues so quietly. 
And that's why I would like to ask you to give your answer. Well, I try not, uh, I do not want to show myself in a very good light. Then uh, I think some things are distorted. I, and I know that you also have here students in the audience and sometimes they do not know to answer a question. But so, and so I did not know at this time the historical significance of the document we signed. So, and I thought that we did some, we just did our work with a good conscience and that so is that it will be better for Belarusia, for Ukraine, and for Russia. And it happened like that. And when I just found out the significance, the historical significance, when I just left uh, uh, the uh, Bielowiesza uh, place, then uh, uh, I also talked, of course, with Nazarbayev, who also want to uh, join uh, these political questions. So I just left with a car, and then I listened to the radio, and then I heard Yeltsin Kravchuk, Yeltsin Kravchuk, and then uh, I heard certain versions, and I heard certain distortions, and then I was thinking, yes, I understood the historical significance. And then I understood that we did something very big and that then I was a little bit afraid because then I asked myself, do I really have the right to, under to sign an international document? This document uh, is a very significant, will become legally valid. Uh, and, but I have to uh, pro, uh, support, uh, bring it to the ratification to the parliament. And we had so many communists there. We had so many people there who just were uh, secretaries, general uh, secretaries. And then I thought, how, how will they react to this document? How will they react to this situation? I was at the end of my political career. That's what I thought. But I was mistaken. The, parliament, the parliaments of all our three countries ratified the document. And then I understood that the historical significance of this document is a very big one. So uh, as far as the present time is concerned, there is this kind of drug, a very horrible drug, and this is the love for power. All the democratical principles have been distorted because of that, and they are destroyed. And then we had a lot of unpleasant events because there was this drug, the love for power. and. And, of course, this was true for many post-Soviet republics, also for the Russian Federation, for Belarusia. But, uh, uh, fortunately, we have Ukraine and we have other countries who did not go this way. And I think this distortion should be considered uh, when you uh, want to have normal capitalism in a country, when you really want the well-being of your citizens, and then you should also uh, want a normal political life for every country. So I would like to answer to this question. So I think this was very interesting to listen to this discussion. Stanislav Stanislavievich also uh, uh, met other persons uh, on an international level. And when he did that, I think he did not foresee everything. Stanislav Stanislavievich. We will not talk, we will not ask him now about this question, but there is also Lee Harvey Oswald who went to Minsk. 
And when there are other possibilities to talk with him, it would be also interesting to uh, hear his memories about Lee Harvey Oswald. But this is not the subject of our discussion. You understand that. But I can tell you, it, it's, of course, very interesting to talk uh, with him about that subject. And Lee Harvey Oswald lived in Minsk. You might know that. But I will not talk about Lee Harvey Oswald. I will go now to you, Witold Pavlovich. And I would like to ask you to answer my questions. Dear Chairman, our symposium, we uh, called it a discussion, you called it a discussion, but a discussion means different opinions and they must not always correspond. They are might also sometimes contradict. And then uh, I uh, propose the following. Well, I am I am an opponent of uh, this to call our agreement uh, a commonwealth or a cooperation. Well, we met and we have shown to each other we were persuading each other uh, to agree. When we had, when there was the time to sign the document, then I saw that this document does not stand uh, some changes or any changes of this agreement of the Commonwealth. What is Commonwealth? What is cooperation? Of we are no bubbles. And this is, uh, of course, a kind of friendship. It is a kind of wedding. It's a kind of marriage and a forced marriage. And I think it's no coincidence that we have this uh, book, Kapitan Roshin. And in this book, it is said what a so when you steal something, you have to do it, and then you have to uh, stand it. Because no other, there were no obligations in this Commonwealth. So if you just look at the text, and then <clears throat> you see that the agreement was signed by, uh, uh, was signed uh, by uh, the leaders of these three countries. So none of these uh, acts was fulfilled because we had it was it was a complete uncomprehensible terminus this cooperation. I was uh, for the Soyuz. I was for the European Union, and we all wanted to have the same. We are still striving for this union. And I ask you also, uh, who changed uh, the text uh, of this uh, agreement? I have here a brochure which was written by one of the workers uh, of Mr. Kravchuk and his delegation, and he is a very dignified person. He is an academic. He is uh, a wonderful biological scientist, Golubets. And I will now translate from the Ukrainian. On the 8th of December, uh, we with Kryzhanovsky, uh, the ambassador of Russia, we were in the main uh, part of the building. And uh, together, we intended to finalize the document. 
the draft was already pretty good, but the name uh, sounded as follows. A agreement on the establishment of uh, the uh, Union of Independent States. And Union is uh, something that people knew too well already, the terms Union. And uh, there was the proposal to call it not Union, but rather Commonwealth of Independent, independent States. And uh, the uh, translation into English was Commonwealth, and our proposal was accepted. I would say that very often people do things they actually are not able to do. But a specialist, a scientist, a biologist, um, undertook uh, to do something to a document. Unfortunately, it was not the best thing he could do. So what do I feel about this document? Well, I need to say I don't feel happiness. The collapse of the Soviet Union is seen by many with happiness. They are glad. They thought that the, that, uh, the world would be better, that it would be safer. Others expected the contrary. There were those who said that this is a successfully implemented program of the American secret services. I, on the other hand, am convinced that the Soviet Union as a historic phenomenon just had come to its end. There had been two deep changes in, in the world, and it would not have been possible to maintain such a construct. And Mr. Shushkevich said, yes, uh, the government of Rishkov didn't want to share its powers with the republics. Uh, the fifth, and in the 50 post-war years, lots of great changes had happened. And therefore, time was ripe to change something. And I acknowledge that the letter of March was sent to the po Politburo to Kotzigin, and this has a great uh, political impact. Authors of this letters were famous people, such as uh, the member of Academy and a Nobel Prize winner Andrei Sakharov, and also the, the physic Valentin Turchin and the historian uh, Medvedev. I heard of this letter already when they were just drafting it. Why? Because one of the signatories was my brother. Valentin Turchin is my brother from my mother's side. And uh, I met him in Moscow incognito. And uh, he was uh, one of the founders of the Helsinki group. He was 
in opposition to the government. And we discussed the issue all night. And I said uh, we, uh, that I didn't agree in, in many things with him. But when I read the letter in its final version, I understood that uh, one can be a heartfelt patriot of one's country, love one's country, and uh, in the same time criticize those who are in power because they were those in power were not competent. They did not allow the exchange of in information. They were very totalitarian, and so on and so forth. We will discuss all of this tomorrow in greater detail. And uh, the, so those authors, they sent the letter, and Sakharov was sent to Gorky and Valentin. He was a doctor of uh, physics. He was uh, one of um, the constructors of nuclear power plants. He worked uh, seven years uh, in a production fabric due to this letter. When I signed the accords, I said, I am not happy, but I think for Valentin and for his cause, this is very important. But I felt very sad because the political map of the world had changed and the superpower was going to vanish. A superpower which actually was a counterweight to the other superpower, which was important in international politics. And uh, so this was something that happened. And uh, I understood that a country was actually vanishing, the people of which had actually suffered so much and the very one of the most important things was the victory over fascism. A country vanished from the map. A country I served. I served many, many years, and I hope you can understand my feelings. Thank you. I am very, very much, uh, I can feel with you, Vitold Pavlich. Thirty years, every day, every year, uh, people always ask in Asia, in America, in Europe, what did you think when you signed this? What did you go through? So I feel very close to what you just said. For a normal person, this, this is a tragedy. And if this tragedy happens due to one's own actions, and if there are sanctions to this, this in the end means to all of us that it was an optimistic tragedy. Why? There are very interesting coincidences in history in Russia. 300 years ago, in November, uh, Peter the Great uh, announced himself emperor of Russia. 
and uh, the country became an empire back then. An empire were, that was welcomed by many countries of the world. There was the victory over Sweden. So this happened 300 years ago. That was when the Russian Empire emerged. And I would like uh, to emphasize something that is very, very difficult to talk about here at this meeting today. The Soviet Union was an empire that was inherently totalitarian. It was, it was uh, established during the time of the terror and it was necessary to illustrate or to solve this situation in a positive way. Uh, the collapse of an empire does not happen without consequences. A collapse of an empire always, is always linked to great threats and dangers with a great impact to the people living this. And there is this post-empire syndrome. And we know what kind of impact this had on the republics in the post-Soviet space. But uh, we need to be very attentive here and cautious. But the, because uh, the collapse was historically necessary and inevitable, because we were wise enough and we were bold enough and we were also wise enough to know that a collapse, an unmanageable collapse, would be too dangerous. And we were bold enough to formulate in the preamble the most important thing of this, the union of the Soviet Socialist Republics as a subject of international law and the geopolitical reality ceases to exist. This is your sentence. sentence. We actually told the people 250 million people and we told the entire world that it ceases to exist. So this is a legitimate process because uh, those uh, three countries, they went through a very crucial and a very difficult phases. And those three republics, they say this not only to themselves, but to the entire world community. This means in some way this process of needs to be needed. I just want to say only one position. So here in from 8 to the 9th of December, with all our uh, founders, we agreed in principle that the Ukraine, Belarus, Belarus and Kazakhstan will just give uh, their nuclear weapons to uh, Russia as a successor of the Soviet Union, as a successor in the UN. So you are happy people. You live in neutral Austria. And we were remembering today uh, with Viktor Pavlovich uh, when uh, 
just imagine think these were nuclear weapons in different forms than they were in the Ukraine, in Belarus, and in Kazakhstan. So in this relation, we did uh, something very great and which was practically not possible to do. And third, well, we stopped uh, uh, we just stopped the uh, Soviet uh, succession. Well, you saw in Yugoslavia what can happen if you have a certain legal construction and if this is not considered legal and there are no legal successors. But now the last item. We are uh, showed to the whole world our values, our principles. And these eight articles of the agreement which we could uh, formulate, which we could create together, these eight articles have shown the values and the aims, the targets on which we will orient ourselves and our obligation towards each other. And in this historical significance, in December of 91, the Cold War was finished, was stopped. Uh, dear Witold, uh, the worst thing for me was when in Camp David, 91, in February, with Boris Nikolaevich and Bush, there was the meeting, and President Bush, uh, when, he under, when he signed the declaration at the end of the Cold War, and then he said he did not think about the moral consequences, and then he just declared that the United States have won the Cold War. Nobody can be a winner of the Cold War. This is, of course, a common process which is developed together. But a very important moment today, we have 2021, and today we have other threats. We have threats, we have things threatening us, and and I would like to really want to thank for this initiative, dear colleagues, <clears throat> to think about the bad things which happened and also to understand how difficult it was uh, to uh, have to uh, get this uh, uh, this uh, freedom and to understand that there are no politicians without ethics and there is no ethics without the beauty of decisions. And my target today as a scientist, and I really would like to call myself uh, a scientist, and uh, and Stoic, because the Stoics of the old age, they uh, just said, uh, as their maxim was, to do what has to be done and what will be, will be. Today, this does not work anymore. Today, this is not correct anymore. We have seen quite a lot during that this does not work in uh, these thousand years. And our aesthetical position, I'm really moved by our meeting today, uh, do what is necessary, what you have to do. And you must hope for something. You must do what you hope for. And then you have to do what you have to do and then do what you are dreaming about. Do what you have to do, and then it will be uh, 
the thing which about we dream and think this is the spirit of our belief to believe each other to be dignified to trust each other to think that the human uh, people have a future despite all threats and I'm quite sure and I'm convinced and I'm more convinced because of your initiative because of our meeting today and I would like to thank you very much and I would like to thank also Falken and I will just uh, promise with him together that tomorrow we will have to tell you also some more interesting things. Now I would like to continue in English. That uh, uh, the, uh, the United States won the uh, Cold War was done on the 25th of December, um, right after Gorbachev uh, had his speech on the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Um, Gorbachev caught Bush at the Christmas turkey. Uh, and there was not very much time to formulate a reaction. Uh, and uh, what came out was this wonderful declaration uh, with this unbelievable you know, effect uh, that the US had won the Cold War. Because if you have a winner, you always have to have a loser. Uh, and uh, with this declaration, uh, I think uh, many, many, many people have lost. Unfortunately, he repeated it, as uh, Gennady said, in the State of the Union declaration on the, I think it was the 20th of January, uh, 1992. Uh, and uh, I think this is, uh, uh, you know, a, a horrible uh, thing that we carry in our uh, rucksacks uh, for long, and uh, a, a complete misunderstanding of what really had happened um, in in the Bielowieska Pusha, allow me for this, uh, uh, Tom, I hope you don't mind that I was saying this. Um, uh, so that's, uh, uh, but now. Uh, we are people who live and we are no automatic people. And what happened in uh, Bielowieska was for me also a difficult. First, I had the feeling of relief. It was the end of anarchy. It was the end of non-determination. It was the end of having no perspectives. The second feeling was sad feeling. Uh, and because it was the country of my youth, it was a big country, it was a great country, uh, which gave a wonderful education to all of us. I do not agree with Reagan that uh, the Soviet Union is the empire of bad and of hell. No, it was a wonderful, it was a great country. And of course, it had black and white sides. It had negative and it had positive sides. It was a country uh, of our world. It was a country who uh, won against fascism, who flew into the cosmos. And I think it was a very emotional moment. We uh, did, uh, we finished our work at 4.30, and on the 7th of December at 10, we had the final version. So, and we were working during the whole night then, and then we stated it that at 10 o'clock in the morning, there should not be uh, there should be a certain document. And the leaders of the state said, yes, you have to do this document, but the main idea is the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And we finished the document at 5.30. And we had then the first draft. And a main role was playing Gaidar. I will talk about him uh, in more details. We had three final versions of the project and of the agreement. And then there was a fourth uh, version, which was then uh, developed by the uh, leaders of the state. It was Gaidar, Kozarev, myself. And the Ukrainian uh, friends had the academic Grisar, 
and they uh, and the Russian delegation with me at the at the head. We agreed the first version of the agreement with the Ukrainian spe uh, specialists, and we did this at nine o'clock in the morning. And the Ukrainian delegation just had one change, one amendment in this agreement. And so the word Soviet Union as an independent uh, country was not mentioned in these three versions. Nobody agreed that this agreement uh, should be called, that the new country should be called Soyuz and not independent state. And there is also an archive of uh, this uh, agreement. and. And I can imagine that this document is a very valuable one. And all this version started with the word commonwealth. And the Ukrainian delegation, when they did the paragraph phrasing of the second version, they only had one amendment. In the first version, uh, it should be called uh, the um, the Commonwealth of Democratic Countries, SDG. And uh, the Ukrainian collegian said they would have never agreed with the word democratical, and they just insisted to change the word in uh, the um, Commonwealth of Independent Countries and not Democratic Countries. And I have copies of this document, and we just uh, just canceled the word democratic, and we inserted the word uh, independent countries. And then uh, when we have uh, printed uh, the document, Kozarev, uh, Golubetsk, uh, Gaidar, they did the paragraphing, paragraphing of uh, this document, and then they gave the document to the leaders of the state. And this work was then done until, until uh, the um, 8th of December. So this was the history of this event. So at 5.30, we finished our work. I went to my room. I laid down, but I could not sleep, and I did not want to sleep. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, there was the, uh, the, the, I hear the Soviet Union hymn in the radio. And I stood up and I listened to the hymn of the USSR, uh, of a country where we uh, were born, where we were educated, where we became people. And I repeat again. Uh, this was a very difficult feeling. But as an historic historian, I understand that USSR will be always written in golden letters in the history of Belarusia because the Russian Empire, uh, and we are always, we will be always part of this of the Russian uh, Empire. Thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. It is difficult to generalize the opinions here and to give an appreciation of this. But I think there is something that is common to all of you who participated. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you for your participation. And I think there is one common thing. The Soviet Union just had come to its natural end. Why did this happen? I think 
we haven't received an answer to this question today. There might be different opinions on it, but the fact is that it had come to its natural end. And then there, the decision had to be made how to be with this for the future. So everybody has their opinion, their interpretation. And uh, I felt like in a film of Kurosawa, where there are different views, uh, but still we need to live together. Thank you very much for this. For this. Tomorrow from 10 o'clock, there will be an opportunity to ask questions to our participants from those countries. We will have uh, uh, the three gentlemen who are here uh, for uh, separate meetings. And uh, not together, each one separately. We start at 10 o'clock. Uh, with uh, uh, Vitali, uh, with uh, Vitold uh, Pavlovich. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, at 11 o'clock uh, Mr. Purbulis and uh, at 12 o'clock uh, Mr. Kravchenko. So yeah, this will be tomorrow, uh, each one of them in the, uh, not here obviously, uh, but in the Musikzimmer here in the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, please come, uh, you know, take advantage of this opportunity. Um, and uh, what uh, will be important to say, tomorrow we will apply Chatham House rules uh, so that we can really have an open discussion. Uh, with this, большое вам спасибо. Прошу вот всех сейчас уходить от and I would like uh, to ask you to step down uh, from the scene here, now from the podium. After such a moving presentation, uh, I have to disappoint you. We have only people who here who were not present <laughs> in the forest of Belarus. But we have an excellent panel of people who were active at the time or are uh, observing what's going on uh, since the, the year 1991. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to, to announce uh, each of them. And uh, first one is Wolfgang Schüssel. I don't have to introduce Wolfgang Schüssel here in Vienna to anybody, but maybe the interesting thing is when, when this negotiation in, in Belarus or in Russia, in Soviet Union took place, he was Minister for Economic Affairs in the Republic of Austria. Uh, and so he already at that time uh, certainly had some ideas about the situation of yes. the Soviet economy uh, at the end of the Soviet Union. And later on, uh, he, uh, he had to deal with uh, what happened there. Uh, our uh, second panelist, uh, Horst Delchik, and he has already been mentioned, welcome as well. Former head of the Munich Security Conference, it was said from 1991 to 2001, something like that, a long time he was head mm -hmm. of that. Uh, but uh, maybe he is even better known for his time as security and foreign policy advisor of Chancellor Helmut Kohl. Uh, mainly dealing with the East, I would say, in, in, in most relations, the, about, about the Polish-German relations, uh, about the inner German relation, but also accompanying um, uh, Kohl to, uh, to the meeting with Gorbachev yeah. at that time, uh, talking about Deutsche Wiedervereinigung uh, and uh, issues like that. Uh, Horst Elschik, uh, later on, became active in, in the business world, uh, and he's now uh, still working as a consultant advisor uh, in many functions on many boards, as is Wolfgang Schüssel, by the way, also east of Vienna on many boards. 
And then I'm happy that we have uh, Thomas Graham with us. Thomas Graham is not only uh, one of the leading analysts of Russian affairs uh, nowadays, but he used to work in Moscow uh, as a US diplomat. He was a civil servant for the US Department for something like that. I was a diplomat, foreign service Diplomat, office. foreign service for about 10 years or something 14 like that. 10 years. Uh, and uh, he was in Russia at the time uh, of the end of the Soviet Union also. He was twice, he was, we were twice uh, in Moscow. Uh, and Thomas Graham is a distinguished fellow of the Council of Foreign Relations and he works for Henry Kissinger Associates uh, and he is regularly teaching uh, on Russian affairs on, from Yale to Harvard. So you mentioned the, the schools he has been teaching on. I, I'm about to ask him whether he would also give a talk here at the <laughs> Diplomatic <laughs> Academy. I have the chance here so, to ask you directly. Uh, and finally, we have Christian Werschütz. I think this is uh, an important uh, uh, part also of our discussion because Christian Werschütz uh, is a distinguished uh, uh, journalist and he has been working for the Austrian radio television for 30 years. 30 years is a long period. Uh, and the main reason why we asked him to be on the panel is that uh, uh, after his, uh, all his ventures on the Balkans, he also has to work in the Ukraine. Uh, he, I think he opened the office of the Australian television in, in, uh, in, in Kiev. Uh, and he's still regularly reporting not only from the Donbass, from the, but from the whole, uh, from the whole uh, Ukraine. Uh, and he is something like an enlightened observer uh, from the, in, in the Austrian uh, journalistic uh, world. So the panel is there. The topic is known. It's about the dissolution of the Soviet Union from a Western perspective. And there I already have my doubts, and maybe also my panelists, uh, whether there is or has been a Western perspective on what was happening in the year 1991, uh, and actually until the present time, uh, whether we have a common Western perspective uh, on these 18 states which came out of, of, of the Soviet Union. Um, uh, and so my first question really goes to, uh, uh, to what is your feeling about this Western common perspective? Uh, and more concretely, what did you think in November, December 1991, when you heard about the dissolution uh, of the Soviet Union. Did you think it's a, it was a momentous event that what happened there? Uh, or were you not surprised because actually it was the end of an empire which, as we heard, could be expected to happen? So what, you, was, your, what was your feeling about this dissolution in 1991? Wolfgang Schüssel, I would like to start with you. So first of all, let me really um, say to the previous panel, great respect, really great respect how you uh, explained uh, the situation, how you worked out this agreement. This is uh, from today's perspective. Imagine what, have, uh, what could have happened. That you mentioned uh, uh, the Yugoslav uh, uh, war, 10 years, 91 to 2001, uh, a bloody war with uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of people killed, and uh, the problems are still not over. Or imagine uh, the conflicts coming from after, because if a, a, an empire falls, you said it, uh, Gennady, if an empire falls, this is a giant uh, falls down to earth. This is it, the earth trembles, and a lot of conflicts uh, originated it at that time are still there. Not either frozen conflicts or still warlike conflicts, Nagorno-Karabakh, or um, conflicts uh, which were at that time present in your mind. I'm sure the Crimea case was present at that time. I remember. Uh, decisions in the in the Russian Parliament uh, was avoided in in your talk. By the way, it would be quite interesting to to hear a little bit about that. So imagine what have could, what could have happened if you were not able to dissolve uh, dissolute uh, the the Soviet Union in a peaceful way with uh, common values, etc. So I think this is uh, absolutely astonishing and. Uh, and earns uh, greatest respect. And I think we should really uh, say that in public. 
The second point, um, I think uh, we were not aware, like you, that you were not aware about the historic uh, situation at that time. That everybody is, uh, politics is always local and always regional. Everybody was uh, more or less obsessed with uh, our own uh, problems, domestic problems, economic problems, social problems. Of course, it was for us not, uh, not a, a catastrophic moment. Uh, everybody felt uh, this, uh, the Soviet empire came to an end, that, as you said it. It was over. It was just over. But the historic uh, consequence, the geopolitical consequence was not at all. Uh, we were not prepared for that. America was not prepared. Otherwise, uh, this uh, a kind of an hybris, the hybris uh, uh, talk like uh, we won the Cold War. I mean, strange. That, or Obama later, uh, Russia is uh, only a regional power. I mean, this is a kind of an hybris which is not, uh, not adequate to the situation. So we were not prepared. The West was not prepared. You were not prepared. That you just did what you dreamed of, what was necessary, what you hoped for, and I think a lot of hopes were fulfilled. Not all of them, not also some, some fears came true. And I think, uh, so in my opinion, we should really a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit decent and humble, because um, what, what, what was achieved in these times uh, was Gaidar was mentioned. And I think really Gaidar was one of the, of the greatest Russian politicians I, 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 I met. And uh, I know him. Uh, he was, he's not very popular uh, even now in, 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 in Russia, but a, a great man. And others are also great uh, people who are not really well known and well estimated uh, in today's uh, politics. So I think uh, this meeting today and tomorrow is also something to put uh, the developments in, the, in, a, in a new, old, better perspective. This is what I want to say at this moment. It's really hard to discuss uh, um, after such a brilliant uh, <laughs> exposition what happened in, in these times uh, 30 years ago. But I think uh, we, sh we, we, we could and should learn. We're younger. Not, I'm not young, but younger than you, um, except uh, Gennady. But what really the younger generation, political generation, could and should learn from your experience and your role model. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wolfgang. Um, the German perspective, I guess, was, was a bit, little bit closer and less local than the Austrian one, <laughs> because uh, for you it meant a lot what was going on uh, at the end of the Soviet Union for the, the future of Germany. Yeah, well, first of all, I would like to join uh, Prime Minister Schüssel in complimenting our Russian guests and, f and f may I say friends. Um, it was really moving uh, how you tried to explain to us uh, the situation uh, when you took the decision to give up uh, uh, the Soviet Union as, as a common uh, state. Uh, well, uh, End of 90, I left government, having uh, unified Germany peacefully. That was uh, good enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, therefore, I left. Um, but uh, I, I tried hard to, to stay in touch with all my uh, Russian friends uh, over the years. And uh, I had the open opportunity when uh, Putin came into an off into office. I was asked by him uh, whether I can meet him sometimes uh, and uh, discuss uh, international affairs. And uh, what I learned from the very beginning, he had one main concern: how to keep the new Russia together. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, with all the republics. Yeah. Uh, uh, for example, uh, he, as you know, he uh, changed uh, the constitution because uh, at the beginning uh, the uh, republics were able to choose their own uh, governor and to uh, elect him. 
without any influence of Moscow. And uh, he was afraid that uh, oligarchs would buy uh, the job of, govern of governors and uh, would do their own business, uh, whatever Moscow might say and think about. And therefore, he changed the constitution. Now, Moscow is deciding who can run for governor and who will be the next governor. Uh, therefore, there was still the concern after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, will Russia dis uh, dissolve? Uh, and uh, I do believe uh, that's still a topic for President Putin. Uh, and uh, you have to, to manage it. We know it from Germany. We have uh, uh, several states as well. And to keep them together uh, on a federal level is a difficult job. And if you look at the big uh, Russia, it's an even tougher job. Another problem uh, I'm aware is uh, the settlement of Chinese people in uh, Siberia. Uh, I had once a discussion in the Kremlin, uh, how many Chinese are already settling in Siberia? Uh, we have uh, uh, information that, uh, uh, meanwhile, about two million Chinese are settling in in, on Russia ter territory. Well, I was, uh, I was uh, told, no, 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 not so many. It's just 200,000. But even 200,000 has a hell lot of people. Uh, and uh, I, re I remember a, me uh, a discussion with the president uh, telling, telling me he never will sell gas to China. Meanwhile, he does. Uh, the question is, what I tell my Russian friends all the time, the saviest border you have are with us, not with China. The last military conflict you had was with China. Uh, and as you know, the Sino-Soviet conflict uh, between uh, Khrushchev and, and uh, the uh, uh, Chinese, uh, 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 what's, sorry, I'm, I'm getting old, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, Mao, yeah, uh, thanks, <laughs> Mao. Uh, the main conflict was that Khrushchev was not ready to join Mao uh, during his war with India at the, at the Chinese-Indian border. And if you look at China today, they, are, they have still fights with Indian on the border. And uh, therefore, the question is, from the very beginning was, uh, what's the future position of, of, of Russia? And uh, I tell you, I had a, uh, a, a speech in Vienna once, together with uh, the uh, former American president, uh, um, who was invited by the by a news, uh, economic newspaper here in in uh, Vienna. Clinton. Huh? Sorry, Clinton. 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 Yeah, was Clinton. It was Clinton. Uh, I was asked by the newspaper to, to start with the speech, and then Clinton will give the main speech. And uh, he got 120,000 euro. I got nothing. My salary was... Uh, we collect something? Uh, I was uh, seated beside him during, during dinner. And, I raised a discussion, uh, I raised a question uh, about the relations with Russia. And he told me that he twice offered 
to Yeltsin to become a member of, the, of NATO, of the North Atlantic Alliance. Uh, he wrote him a letter and he, he discussed it with him. Yeltsin's answer at that time was, it's too early for us to, to decide whether we should join NATO or not. But this offer was even on the table with Putin at the beginning. And uh, when I was asked by him uh, to discuss what he should say in the German bu uh, um, Bundestag, uh, parliament, the German parliament, my proposal to him was to define the future position of Russia on a global level. Is Russia part of Europe? Or are you separating from Europe? Uh, and what, what, you, what the EU president nowadays seems to try is to, to tell the public uh, we are world power and our main partner is China nowadays. I don't, I'm not sure whether you will be comfortable in the long run with China. Uh, that's not an easy partner. Um, but uh, uh, it's still a question for, your, for Russia where your position is internationally. And uh, uh, Putin's speech in the German Bundestag, he tried to define the Russian position. He said, he has said, uh, Russia is a um, friendly European country, whatever that means. Yeah. And uh, I think we started in that direction between East and West. But meanwhile, uh, I think uh, we have uh, not enough contacts. We have not enough uh, exchange of people uh, on all levels. I'm in favor of exchanging people on all levels, whether youngsters, pupils, uh, scientists, cultural people. You see, our main orchestras are conducted by, by Russian conductors. Uh, the cultural exchange works very well. We have more than 100 uh, partnership between cities. I think this is the right way uh, to move ahead. The question is, what will be the position of, of Russia? Uh, and uh, you will see uh, after Afghanistan, uh, uh, you will face a, a lot of problems with Afghanistan because uh, the drug traffic will go uh, through Russia, <coughs> France, mainly. Uh, once you had the problems with AIDS, a similar situation. Uh, it's now improving. But my main concern is, where is Russia really going? You, you're already taking up the second part of our discussion. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, because we are among ourselves. What did you feel the moment you heard that the Soviet Union is dissolved? <laughs> well, uh, uh, first uh, of all, I was happy that I happened to go to sauna with Yeltsin and Helmut Kohl. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, an, an unbelievable picture. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, this, this was my first relief. No. Uh, the first interest was this crucial question. What, what can we do and will we do all we can do to integrate Russia into Europe, be becoming part of European affairs? And uh, it started in the right way, but uh, it stopped. You see, we have had, before the conflict in the Ukraine started, we had a uh, wonderful proposal on the table. 
an all European free trade zone from Vancouver to uh, Vladivostok. Yeah? Why didn't we move forward with this uh, great idea? I believe Ukraine, the Ukraine conflict wouldn't have come up at that time when we were successful and the Russians were in, were in favor. Uh, the Europeans were not good enough to push it forward. Yeah, that, that's what Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin said at the Munich Security Conference in 2008, I think. Well, uh, look, uh, this was, uh, I invited Putin to Munich. He had two invitations, one by, by uh, uh, the Swiss uh, uh, organization. Uh, the World Economic Forum? Davos. Yeah. Uh, the World Economic uh, Organization and the second one by me. And he told me in Moscow, if he will come, he will come first to me. And he did. And if you read his speech in Munich, it was a summary of all his concerns vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Europeans. And there was no real answer on that. The, the German Chancellor uh, gave a speech before him proposing to intensify the relations between NATO and Russia. But nobody asked her, nor the, nor the Russian president, what they think about it and what that really means concrete, well, concretely. And uh, therefore, it was uh, a proposal by the German Chancellor Merkel without any response. And if you read Putin's speech, he was summing up all his concerns with the Westerners, with the United States, with the Europeans. My foreign secretary, at that time it's now the federal president in Germany, he, ca he gave his speech a, a day later without mentioning with one word the speech of Putin. There was no response at all. And uh, one journalist uh, stood up asking the president, was your speech now the beginning of a new Cold War? And these were the headlines in the German newspapers, international newspapers the next day. Absolutely crazy. Uh, and look, uh, his follow follower was Medvedev. Medvedev gave a speech a year later in Berlin, proposing a very good idea from my point of view. Uh, he proposed <coughs> to negotiate the Paris Charter of, an all, of a common Europe from November uh, 90 into a treaty. There was no response on the Western side, neither in Germany nor in Europe, never, no, nowhere. And you can't uh, deal with uh, a country like Russia just uh, not mentioning anything what they are proposing, not answering anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, my foreign secretary a day later gave a speech talking two-thirds of his speech talking about um, environmental problems, climate change and such things. And I told him uh, immediately that he should change his job, <laughs> uh, becoming a minister for, for environmental issues. He changed. Not anymore for foreign <laughs> affairs. Yeah. President. And dealing with our Rus Russian partners that way, a, form, a former or still a world power. You are still a world power uh, concerning your uh, mm. you know, armament uh, and nuclear power. Uh, you can't deal with Russia that way. 
Yes, so this is also the perspective that you hear from the Kremlin today, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I guess Thomas Graham will have a bit of a different view on, 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 on 91 and on, on the Western position. So did the US win the Cold War? <laughs> <laughs> first, let me add my compliments. Uh, the first panel really was terrific and quite moving uh, in the description of their own personal experience. Uh, and I think none of us really appreciated the depths uh, of your own emotions as you dealt with what was a very, uh, I think, troubling and difficult experience as you s sought to deal, build yourself a, a better, wor better world. Um, let me answer two, uh, uh, two questions that you've asked. First is, what were we surprised in November and December of 1991? And then the second question about whether we won the Cold War or not. Uh, you know, I don't think that the United States was really surprised by what happened in November and December. Now, you know, the specific events, yes, we hadn't predicted. Uh, but, you know, I had been working in the embassy in Moscow, uh, 87, 88, 89, 90. Uh, and we had a wonderful set of contacts across the country, the Soviet Union. Uh, and we were reporting back to Washington I think as early as uh, late 1988, certainly in 1989, that we needed to think about the possibility of the breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, we saw the various national movements in the Caucasus, um, in the Baltic states, the Russian Declaration of Sovereignty uh, on June 12th of 1990 uh, was also an indication that things were moving uh, in a direction where we needed to give serious thought to the possibility of the breakup. Uh, and as early as 1989, back in Washington, uh, the, the Deputy National Security Advisor uh, set up something that we called the UNGroup, because it, the group wasn't supposed to exist. Uh, but it's a very small group of senior officials drawn from the National Security Council, the State Department, and the Defense Department, the Central Intelligence Agency, to think through what the consequences would be of growing dis, uh, dis, destabilization, uh, and even potential breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, now, it's something that we didn't want to contemplate. Uh, and certainly, if you ask the president himself, his senior advisors, uh, it was something that we certainly we weren't seeking, uh, and we weren't pleased by the, the prospect of that happening. So there was a tendency at the very highest levels to ignore what was happening at a somewhat lower echelon in the government. Now, President Bush um, clearly uh, did not want to see the breakup of the Soviet Union. We didn't want to see the breakup for some of the reasons that I've already mentioned. Empires don't collapse uh, peacefully, usually. Uh, we've already seen violence in Karabakh, for example. Uh, we saw later in 1990 uh, what the Soviet state did to the Lithuanians and the Latvians uh, because of their effort to move towards independence. And we thought that was a pre precursor of what would happen if the country actually came apart. The August Push uh, itself, uh, sort of a, a, a revenge of the Soviet state against um, uh, what was happening in the country. Um, and so uh, I think we were legitimately concerned about that and add to this is a country with thousands of nuclear weapons spread out across the country. Uh, so how are we going to deal with that? And that is something where we are, uh, we Americans thought we always had a special responsibility. We would talk to our European partners about it, but we dealt with the security relation, the nuclear relationship with the, the Russians, first of all. And then there was another personal aspect of why President Bush didn't want to see the breakup, and that was he was doing quite well with Gorbachev, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had done German reunification, uh, for example. We had uh, worked with Russia in the first Gulf War. We had an arms control. Uh, agreement uh, that we were negotiating with Gorbachev. Um, and in many ways, Gorbachev, through his policies, was advancing what we saw as an American agenda in Europe and, and globally. So why did we want to see this man disappear from the, uh, from the, uh, from the political stage? That said, I think as our, uh, the first panel indicated, we really saw the August Push as uh, the end of the Soviet Union. We began to talk about the former Soviet Union directly after that, and we began to put in place um, some policies that we uh, hoped would answer our concerns. One of the first things President Bush did 
uh, after the breakup of the, of the Soviet Union, was announced a presidential uh, nuclear initiative uh, where we unilaterally uh, decided to withdraw many of our tactical nuclear weapons uh, from our uh, naval vessels, submarines, uh, and so forth, in the hopes that the Soviet Union would respond in a similar fashion, because one of the things we wanted to see happen was these tactical nuclear weapons, the ones that worried us most, uh, not being scattered across uh, 15 republics, but reconsolidated uh, in, uh, in, in Russia under uh, some sort of uh, secure control, to lessen our concern about that. Uh, we also moved uh, after um, the dissolution, the formal dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, to make sure that the, the four countries that had nuclear, strategic nuclear weapons uh, signed on to the nonproliferation treaty. Uh, we also were very happy and worked to bring those strategic weapons back into Russia uh, under Russian control. Uh, and then the final aspect, uh, 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 after the breakup of the Soviet Union was a clear indication that we didn't want to see the resurrection of the Soviet Union, uh, is our Secretary of State made a tour of all the, uh, the new, newly independent states, uh, and we established a process by which we recognized and set up diplomatic relations with all of these countries in very short order. Uh, so it wasn't as if we, we were surprised to some extent, but it isn't if, as if we hadn't thought about this before. And much of the, the literature that suggests otherwise, I think, is mistaken. Now to answer the second question. Um, you know, President Bush, uh, throughout 1989, uh, revolutions in, in Eastern Europe, the fall of the Berlin Wall, always made a point in his conversations with Gorbachev that I didn't gloat. I didn't want to make things more difficult for you. Um, when the Soviet Union finally broke up, then it comes out. Um, uh, you know, we won. Uh, if you look at his State of the Union in 1992, um, we won the Cold War. But you have to remember the domestic con uh, uh, context. This was the beginning of a re-election campaign. Yeah. Uh, and he wanted to present a successful foreign policy at this point. And there's one other aspect uh, to this as well uh, that I think was quite popular in the United States at that time. Uh, you know, we need to remember that the 20th century really was a, uh, a century of a titanic struggle among different philosophies and ideologies, fascism, communism, and liberal democracy. And certainly the pre prevailing view in the United States, 1989, 1990, 1991, uh, is that with the breakup of the end of the Cold War, the breakup of the Soviet Union, that was a victory for liberal democracy that came 44, 45 years after the defeat of fascism in the Second World War. Um, and that, I think, inspired a lot of the way we dealt uh, with Russia uh, after 1991. Uh, you know, we saw uh, those events as a vindication of the American model. Uh, and we wanted to work closely with Russia. We wanted to integrate Russia in the Euro-Atlantic community. We wanted Russia uh, to undertake democratic reforms and free market reforms, because if they did, that would only uh, further, I think, solidify or validate what we saw as a, as a verdict of history. So partnership became a very important element of the United States after 1991. I think it's unfortunate uh, that we talked about the uh, about a victory uh, in the Cold War, as if we won defeating the Russians. Uh, one of our ambassadors at that time has written a, a long book about the, the end of the Cold War, and the point he made was, the end of the Cold War is a negotiated settlement. Uh, Gorbachev, the Russians, uh, played an integral role uh, in doing that, uh, and we need to separate the end of the Cold War from the collapse of the Soviet Union. And if we do that, we can see uh, that we actually had partners in Russia in ending the Cold War. And we need to think of that as a common victory uh, and not as a victory by the United States or the West largely uh, construed over, over Russia. But, but as you said, you, you saw it a bit like Francis Fukuyama. You saw the end of history uh, that democ democracy has won at the end. The end. Absolutely. Uh, and secondly, uh, if I would be a Russian observer, I would say, so why did you then expand the NATO to the east? 
when you were so much interested in working with Russia. But this is not my question. Right, because we didn't fully <laughs> trust the Russians. That's the <laughs> because you didn't trust the Russians. <laughs> Very good question. Uh, uh, Christian Verschütz, uh, as an Austrian, I think uh, you're more pragmatic on, on these issues than, than talking about uh, the geopolitical side of it. What is your take on, the, uh, on 1991? How did you experience that? Uh, and how did you see what the West did afterwards? Look, first of all, 1991, I was 30 years uh, younger, and my younger daughter was almost three years old. We had already, and you must not forget, this is the bloody breakdown of the former Yugoslavia. And we should also not forget that when we were talking about the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia, it was always we must not allow the independence of Slovenia and Croatia because should, this could have a negative impact on the Soviet Union. Then you had the peaceful breakdown at the end of the Soviet Union, but you had the bloody uh, breakdown of um, uh, the former Yugoslavia, which uh, Richard Holbrook mentioned is one of the greatest failures of Western policy after 1939 or 1940. Uh, so the feeling was, uh, thanks God, it was peaceful on the one hand. On the other hand, um, you know, there is one question, one of three questions Immanuel Kant, uh, born in Königsberg in Kaliningrad, has raised, and this is the question, what can we know? And uh, I think uh, to a certain extent uh, in the years before the declaration uh, of the 8th of December, uh, in the West there was an underestimation about the decisive role Ukraine was playing in uh, this uh, drama of, of uh, the breakdown uh, of Soviet Union, maybe without uh, mentioning uh, Spignev Pryszynski, who was most likely well aware of it. Uh, this is the one uh, reason. And the second point is also the question uh, how you can influence processes. And uh, as Mr. Graham has mentioned, his former ambassador, uh, Jack F. Madlock, who has written the famous book, Out of the Union Empire, and uh, I had the chance to interview Mr. Madlock now for uh, 50 minutes about this breakdown. Uh, uh, please al allow me to make one quotation of this interview, uh, which we did with him, because this is, this is related to the question, did we win uh, the Cold War? Uh, first, I would, would like to mention, he was referring in this interview that since July 1990, he was writing about the possibility of the breakdown of Soviet Union. So he was, it was not a surprise uh, for the United States. But um, then he was uh, referring uh, to, to the question of the, uh, of the Cold War. And he was saying here in the quote from this interview, um, President Bush made a speech in Kiev on August 1st, 1991, recommending that Ukraine and the other non-Russian republics, aside from Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, that they adhere to Gorbachev's Union Treaty. Of course, that appeal fell on deaf ears. That was not something that we could control, but I do think that today, when people, too many people are talking about, oh, we won the Cold War, no. We negotiated an end to the Cold War, which was as much in the interest of the Soviet Union and it was to the United States and to our European allies. And uh, I think uh, it's a pity that and Mr. Delchik has referred to it that we lost to a certain extent Russia, if uh, we may uh, say this. And uh, if you look now at the situation, it is clear that we are uh, uh, at least since 2014 uh, on a very, very uh, confrontative approach. And Mr. Briggs, as you mentioned, NATO enlargement. Mr. Matlock thinks this was a mistake. Uh, thank you very much. We couldn't avoid already speaking in the first round about the presence and the future. So the, the sh we have time for a short second round. Uh, that's about the relations nowadays. Uh, what is the consequence? 30 years is not long, as we know. Transformation takes time. Look at, 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 at Poland, look at, at the Czech Republic. You, we all feel that Hungary, uh, there is still transformation going on from the old system to a new system. So what is your take on, on the situation now uh, in the post-Soviet space? We are only talking about uh, Russia, but actually 
there are so many countries which have a, are in the post-Soviet space, uh, and how you see the perspectives uh, uh, from our side of cooperation today. Wolfgang Schüssel, I'd love to start with you. No, the first question is, uh, I think one of you mentioned uh, so that there is a, a genuine link of uh, an empire to authoritarian structures, autocratic structures. And I think this is something uh, which cannot be solved from outside, that we can criticize, we can analyze uh, the situation, but so to say, the change must come from inside. So this is something what, what we learn, what we have to learn, maybe a, bit, a <coughs> maybe a bitter lesson. Regime change is not possible from outside. It is not, is not good. A change in, uh, in, in, in values, in, in perspectives must come from inside. Uh, so there is for, the situation in Belarus, is for, for us, seen from outside, is terrible, absolutely terrible. The situation in Russia, economically, politically, is not, uh, not what we hoped for. And I, I'm fully on the side of Horst. Uh, so the, the first uh, five, six years of uh, Vladimir Putin, I had the same experience like you. I was skiing with him in Alberg, and we had very interesting talks. And exactly what, what Horst said, he was interested to, to bring Russia into the, into the, the European uh, area and to reform the economy etc etc and the question for us is when and how did we lost uh, russia or Ru or how and when changed russia's perspective on their own uh, on their own position this is not easy I'm, i don't want to uh, to to to, um, to to go along with this self blame game that we are guilty i think this is something uh, both sides have to think about what happened and uh, what how can we change it? And the uh, short answer from my side, I think uh, we are now in the lowest point of, uh, of bilateral relations with Russia. That's, that's for sure. And uh, nobody would disagree. Um, but I'm a stubborn optimist. This must not uh, be forever. I think we can change it from both sides. If we move in a positive direction, if we offer something, and if also from, 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 the, from the Russian side, uh, there, there, there are signals and, uh, and, and ideas and incentives uh, to change the situation, we should be open. And that's, for instance, the European Green Deal. This is my, uh, <laughs> my, my Russian friends know it. I think this could be a game changer because European alone, alone cannot uh, change uh, the situation, cannot solve the climate uh, uh, situation. This is absolutely impossible. We have 8% of our CO2 emissions worldwide, um, and Russia has a huge potential on that. Largest uh, country CO2 uh, CCUS strategy, uh, uh, hydrogen uh, production forestation, etc. So I think a lot of, uh, of co cooperation is possible. So are we able and willing to change from confrontation to cooperation? There must be an offer from the European side and hopefully a positive answer from, from, uh, from the Russian side. I think the recent uh, speeches of Vladimir Putin were, were quite interesting on that. So there is really now a change going on inside uh, the Russian economy, inside the Russian political scene. Prime Minister Mush, uh, Mushkin also used uh, a, a quite interesting burden on, on climate change. And of course, on the political s uh, situation, uh, this, uh, the same. I mean, Ukraine, uh, I mean, for me, from seeing from outside, it's absolutely strange to see that Ukrainian population was always pro-Russian, like the Belarusian population is always pro-Russian. So why the hell is, uh, so to say, the present situation, the present policy of the Kremlin de facto alienating uh, the, 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 the Ukrainian population from, uh, from, from, from Russia? And I'm also not sure how the situation is, uh, is, in, is in Belarus. This is not by far not, uh, not, not perfect. So I think, and by the way, the, the interesting thing for us, uh, the change 30 years ago was not forced by an army, not by a single soldier, not by a single shot. It was changed by politicians, by personalities, and by the will of the people. That the, the, the Berlin Wall was not destroyed by the West German army or by NATO. No, 
by average DDR citizens who want to change the situation. So this is the, the interesting thing. So uh, Russia is such a huge and interesting country with such an enormous potential on talents, on uh, culture, as you said it uh, before, on uh, perspectives, on resources, etc. And you have a choice. Russia has a choice and we have a choice. Either Russia wants to become uh, the junior of China, right? like uh, Robin versus Batman, good luck, <laughs> or to be an on equal footing, a partner, a good partner for the European Union, and yeah. of course also for Americans and others. And by the way, it would be good for America and European Union to treat Russia as an equal partner, as an interested, interesting, respected partner. And of course, not to mention Ukraine and Belarus, etc. This is. I'm, I'm very happy, for instance, that uh, um, Bundeskanzlerin Merkel. Uh, uh, rang the telephone with uh, Lukashenko. And she was criticized, interestingly, by the new incoming coalition. And why the hell this is not according to our rules, our values, this is, uh, so to say, uh, appeasement. Uh, why the talk, talk, talk. This is the result. This dialogue is the only way if you want to avoid a military conflict. And as you said it, you had uh, the interest of your people in mind when you went to this uh, uh, strange forest in, in Belarus. And having the, the mind, the interest of our people in mind, this is first peace, welfare, positive perspective, family life, etc. This is what we have to, uh, and to save the planet, of course, as well. This is what we have to have in mind. And it's not contra our own national interests, but it would also serve, so to say, the, 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 the common interest on the global scene. I think it's quite easy. As a stubborn optimist, I say the pessimist is the only mist, of dem nichts wächst, bitte das zu übersetzen. So this is the, the, the pessimist is the only garbage, but nothing can grow. And this is a German, a German game, <laughs> yeah. a German watch piece. Thank you very much for that. But Sergei Lavrov once said to me, I'm not paid for to be an optimist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <When they are>. <laughs> <laughs> Sergei Lavrov <laughs> is sometimes, uh, is sometimes. He can be quite cynical, yes. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 the, I think it's a kind of a masochist sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hosteltschik, from the German perspective, uh, you already said that we have similar things to Wolfgang Schüssel, actually, that we should uh, be as open as possible for, for the dialogue. But still, we have uh, Russian soldiers in the post-Soviet space in so many countries. And if you ask the, the governments in these post-Soviet countries, they would give you a totally different answer. What should we tell them? Well, I think uh, uh, we, we haven't praised uh, our Russian, uh, I'd, I say, friends at that time. Uh, in 89, 90, 91, uh, what they really have done. We have unified uh, Germany. There was no a single shot, peacefully. Yeah. And your president at the time, uh, uh, he said in May 89, he gave a speech in Mainz in Germany, saying uh, that he will not uh, question the legitimate security interests of, so of Soviet Union. This was a very important promise. Yeah? And, uh, uh, and uh, he dealt with, uh, with uh, Gorbachev and uh, yet uh, always on the same eye level. Yeah? And you have had a president uh, telling the public uh, uh, Russia is a regional power. Yeah? And your current president, when he was the, uh, uh, vice president, he gave a speech in Lithuania uh, saying uh, that uh, uh, Russia, uh, what was his uh, sentence? Russia is uh, uh, economically a poor country, similar to that. You see, such uh, public statements are terrible for our Russian partners. 
and you can't deal on a, on the same eye level if you t if you tell uh, your partner publicly all the time they are, you are weak you, are, you, are, you face a hell lot of problems and so on and so on and. Uh, and it was President Bush uh, as well who said, 91, we need a new world order. And uh, you see, uh, Bush Jr., when he was president after 9-11, he said, we will go for a worldwide alliance against terrorism. NATO immediately responded. The second one was Putin. Uh, Putin saying, uh, we will join such a worldwide alliance uh, against uh, terrorism. And uh, even China did it. But then you intervened in uh, uh, Afghanistan in, uh, and in, in, in Iran, Iraq, Iraq, without consulting anybody. Yeah? The British. Uh, the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think you, uh, these are uh, developments missing opportunities. Yeah. When when Putin said, "I will join such an alliance," I would immediately st have started to, to think about how we can manage it. Yeah. Uh, but giving no answer at all. Uh, that's not the right way. And uh, look, we signed, all 27 presidents and prime ministers have signed a charter in Paris uh, of a new Europe. And if, you, uh, if the substance of this um, declaration was, um, a common European house, as Gorbachev uh, 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 said to it, about it, a common European house where every inhabitant has the same security, gets the same security guarantees. And we agreed on the principles, how to shape it. We, pres uh, we agreed on, uh, on pro procedures how to move ahead, yearly conferences of the foreign secretaries, uh, after some time, conferences uh, of the prime ministers and head of government, and we have still in Vienna. Uh, uh, still, we have the OSCE, actually, yeah, you have which has been OECD, created for this have, cooperation. Uh, an institute uh, for crisis prevention in. here in Vienna. But do we hear anything about it internationally? Nothing for decades. Why did the prime ministers and presidents don't meet uh, on that level and say, let's take, how can we move ahead? Why did the foreign secretaries uh, don't meet uh, once a year saying, what can we do? The same with, with uh, NATO. Uh, you see, uh, the NATO secretary sent now, has sent all uh, Russians, uh, Russian diplomats uh, back home, saying they are uh, spies. They are just spying. Well, it's crazy. Each diplomat, even Americans, if they get secret information, they will take it and use it. Mm -hmm. yeah? Sending all Russian diplomats back home means there are no contacts anymore between NATO and Russia. Why? Yeah, well, it's maybe Mr. Graham should respond to that immediately and try to explain how, how he or the U.S. sees these sort of relations. <laughs> uh, I think as a matter of fact, it's the Russians that uh, closed down the, their mission in NATO. It may have been a response to certain diplomats being um, being ejected for one reason or another, but uh, the Russians exercised the initiative in saying these these contacts were no longer useful. Um, that's neither here nor there. Um, let me make sort of a larger point uh, uh, about the the relationship with Russia. 
from both the American standpoint and I think from the larger Western standpoint. Uh, you know, I think the, the period, uh, in the late Soviet period, the early 1990s, uh, when there were such hopes for cooperation uh, between our countries, Russia, the other countries of the uh, former Soviet space, uh, is something of an aberration in history. Uh, the fact of the matter is that our relationship, the U.S. relationship with Russia, has been competitive more or less from the moment the United States has emerged as a, as a great power on the international stage at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and we're separated by differing worldviews, geopolitical interests, and different values that inform uh, the structures of our domestic uh, political systems. Uh, I think if you look at this from the European standpoint, I don't think that I'm wrong in saying one of the big problems of European history for at least the past 200 years and probably longer uh, is actually how do you integrate Russia into the European space? Uh, because you sense that it's alien in some way, but you understand as well that it's critical to your own sense of security. Uh, and those problems can, can continue till today, and I think we're seeing that played out in the environment today. There is a danger in assuming that we should be able to cooperate uh, without recognizing the differences. Uh, because then when we fail to cooperate, we don't see that as a, a consequence of different national interests, different he uh, histories that we have to manage in some way if we're going to survive. Uh, we begin to see that as a moral flaw in one side or the other. We certainly do that with the Russians, and you see that in the demonization of Russia in American politics today, but the Russians do it to a certain extent with us. I won't speak for the Europeans, but I think something similar happens here. So I think it's important if we're going to move forward and build relations that are constructive is that we acknowledge the differences, uh, we try to understand where those differences come from, and then say, despite those differences, there are reasons why we need to cooperate on certain issues. Uh, there are areas where we're going to continue to compete. We need to compete responsibly so that we avoid the types of catastrophic conflicts uh, that serve the interest of no one. So I would urge a much more sort of realistic assessment of where we are in the world, not trying to paper it over, um, not talking about uh, a situation in which we all should be able to cooperate. I mean, even if you look at climate change, I think what Putin has said recently is encouraging. Uh, but we, ha we think about different climate changes in different ways. And the consequences for climate change are going to be different from the United States, different for Russia, and different for Europe. It is an existential threat of some sort to humanity as a whole. Uh, but states focus on specifics and not sort of the general. They have to defend their own interests. Uh, and so if we assume that it's going to be an easy path to cooperation on climate change, I think we're going to find ourselves disappointment, disappointed, and that will lead to accusations of bad faith. So um, uh, I think let's approach this uh, with a sense of humility, with a sense of uh, the real differences that we're going to have to manage. Uh, we look at the world in different ways. Uh, there's nothing... Uh, immoral about that, nothing necessarily wrong about that, but it does complicate the role of governments and of diplomats uh, to manage what is, a, uh, is an increasingly complex world. Um, so that's where I would leave it. Thank you. Uh, it's good to have a journalist at the end. So how, how to deal with differences? You, you, you journalists like differences and, and clashes and conflicts. So what's the future? Uh, no, to a certain extent, I agree, because uh, uh, it is clear that a presidential election where you have a second round is the best for journalism, whereas to do a story about Bosnia and Herzegovina, this is a nightmare for a journalist who has two and a half minutes to do such a story. <laughs> uh, but uh, I would, uh, may I start with uh, one you said at the beginning, 30 years is not a long period. I completely disagree. 30 years is an extremely long period if you are looking from the perspective of a simple person. A person who was uh, in, in 1999 or 1991, 25 years, and there was in, 19, in April 1992, it was first time in Ukraine. And they saw the optimism. We have everything. We can build a successful country. And then until 1998, I was each year in different parts of Ukraine. 
and I have seen how the optimism was vanishing away. Uh, voucher privatization, or what you had, uh, Couponi, Capovanzi, whatever you had. And if you are living now in such a country, and I, I'm living there, where the Red Cross is not coming anymore because hospitals are so filled with COVID patients that in, uh, if nobody is dying, you have no space. And where you have an enormous uh, 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 pauperization of, of, of people, of pensioners, then for these guys, uh, said, I, I have never seen that they were talking about geopolitics, so thinking about how I can survive and I can make a better life. And you have this enormous mass migration uh, to Poland, to other countries from Ukraine. Uh, you see it also in the, in the Donbass. So I, I think uh, we must be aware that we have these countries have to solve their own problems, uh, but people will maybe have a better idea about what is democracy if they had uh, the chance to live in, democr in democracy countries, not in a kind of robber baron capitalism they have faced uh, in the, within the breakdown of, of the Soviet Union. This is the one point I want to make. Uh, secondly, mm, okay, uh, it, is, it was Gorbachev saying, uh, Europejski Dom, common European house, and uh, what I guess the Russians have really the right feeling is, okay, we have this common European house, but we decided you are living in the basement and we are living in the pelletage. <laughs> uh, and this is not uh, really very, very smart politics. On the other hand, uh, you must see that there are principles uh, where really Russia in Europe could show that it's ready for compromise. And this is mainly the Eastern Ukraine. I, I completely disagree is that here you have only to blame Russia, because you must also see is uh, Kiev ready to fulfill Minsk, what was done since 2017 with more or less blocking economic and um, uh, relationship with this region. But this is maybe the lacmus test, the main test, where you can see what can be achieved uh, in, in Europe. And in this way, uh, personally, I'm uh, a pessimist, also it's missed, uh, uh, because of the real thing, each conflict which is longer than seven years uh, is very difficult to handle, So you see if you look at all other conflicts. And the second thing is, uh, if you ask Martin Seidig about the Minsk negotiations, uh, the international side was much more interested in humanitarian questions than uh, both count parties of conflict. If you are now in this region and you are looking that formerly, when you wanted to go from Donetsk to Mariupol, you had to drive, to drive 90 minutes. And now you have to go from uh, Donetsk to Milivoye, which is uh, the most uh, used uh, border post between Russia and Ukraine because the post in Kharkiv is so corrupt. Uh, then people are staying at this border post only 10 hours to come to the other side. So uh, we have to try to improve the living of the peoples, and maybe we can give, uh, give them also some hope that so-called European values and other things will really not be something only for political speeches, uh, but also for uh, their daily life. And Mr. Graham, I only want to finish. Realpolitik is the only real approach which you can have to solve problems. Thank you very much. I, I think we have made a, a great round of between optimism, pessimism, uh, possibilism, realism. <laughs> uh, we don't know how long 30 years really is. So we just heard it's very long or short, very short, sorry. We heard about empires which exploded and uh, we don't know whether they still exist in the mind of some people. When I listen, to Vladimir Vladimirovich, I got the feeling that he feels that Russia is still an empire. Uh, but I'm a moderator. I'm a pure moderator who is not allowed to say anything like this. My only job is here to thank our speakers and to ask you for a round of applause for our brilliant speakers. Thank you.